So if the social contract is the answer, what is the question? Well, according to classic social contract theory, the question is called the state of nature, that necessary and oh-so-convenient foil to the civil society that classic social contract theory fancies it constructs, the dark black cloth to the glittering diamond of civil society. Every account of the state of nature predetermines or at least predisposes to a certain kind of society. And what I want to try and do in this paper is to explore what sort of society we end up with if we begin with Michel Serre's account of the state of nature, or what, what most approximates in Michel Serre's thought to a state of nature, uh, which I'm going to inflect through the notion of the parasite. So first of all, the classic state of nature and the making of modernity. In other words, what is it that Serre subverts? What is it that he is not like? I'm going to just spend a few minutes trying to tease that out. The state of nature of the classical social contractarians, so we're talking Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and others, uh, systematically does three things. This is my reconstruction of it. Uh, it reduces, it partitions, and it exploits. Uh, and I want to just uh, walk through each of those relatively quickly uh, using Rousseau, who's the, the social contract theorist with whom Serre most explicitly engages in his own work. Uh, so first of all, the state of nature is a reduction. Uh, we see this uh, in Rousseau in his flattening of difference between all the different communities that he incorporates in his state of nature. So he references, uh, quote, Caribs and Hottentots. Uh, he references the Congo. He references Venezuela in the second discourse. Um, but despite all their obvious differences, uh, they're all adduced as examples of one homogeneous and flat state, undifferentiated, that he calls the singular state of nature. And despite the evolutionary stages that he gives it, and this is um, uh, an innovation in Rousseau compared to previous social contract theories, despite that, the state of nature is still for Rousseau, without exception, referred to in the singular, uh, with no parallel or anomalous developments. There's no multiple modernities. There's no multiple states of nature. There is the singular state of nature. And this state of nature motif, then, in Rousseau, exerts a homogenizing, we might almost call it liquefying effect, uh, discarding important and considerable differences and the hard edges between different communities in order to create out of many diverse groups a, a single, smooth, universal, pre-civil state, the state of nature. And I think create is, is the right term here, uh, because like any broad abstract category, the state of nature is, is not really em empirically observable anywhere. It has to be created and curated through selective attention and smoothing away of inconvenient differences. Uh, Rousseau, like the other state of nature theorists, didn't let inconvenient anthropological accounts get in the way of his reconstruction of a global, undifferentiated state of nature. Now, Serre sums this up uh, in the following way. Um, and I, I translate my quotations into English, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so the first who, and it's obviously um, riffing on the first sentence of the second part of Rousseau's second discourse here, the first who, uh, having enclosed a piece of ground uh, or a field, uh, bethought himself to exclude all that was already there, uh, was the real founder uh, of the subsequent historic era. So there's a clearing away that's necessary. Uh, in constructing the state of nature. And this moment of the construction of the state of nature belongs to what I think we can call a, a pathology of modern philosophers, what Serre certainly calls a pathology of modern philosophers, who, quoting from the Parasite, um, uh, play in this imaginary world where there's only one system uh, and where this is co only constructed by uh, only through one unique norm or principle. So that's what the state of nature is doing for Serre. So that was the first homogenizing moment. The second moment of the state of nature is partition. Uh, it takes this carefully curated, homogenized state of nature, uh, and it contrasts it with an equally abstract, flat notion of civil society, creating a dichotomy out of a continuum. 
And this dichotomy, of course, is most pronounced in Rousseau's Du Contrat Social, but it's, it's there as well in the Discours sur l'origine de l'inégalité, uh, where despite all the variegation in Rousseau's progressive account of the state of nature, and, and some people say it's got three stages, some people say it's got seven stages, however many it's got, it's still uh, the, the single qualitative transformation is between the state of nature and civil society uh, for Rousseau. And this moment of, of diuresis is just like the flattening that precedes it, a chasing away of ambiguity. You're in the state of nature or you're in civil society. Those are your two options. There's nothing in the middle. Um, and this cre creates a space for, for the third moment of the classical state of nature. This uh, civil society state of nature dichotomy is uh, an idealizing distinction that Sayer likens to the distinction between the flickering shadows of Plato's cave and the brilliant noonday shadowless sun outside. Uh, and, and he quite rightly, I think, points out that such a distinction exists nowhere on Earth. Uh, it, it, it exists, if anywhere, on the moon, uh, where you do, you have no atmosphere to diffuse and to diffract the light, where you do get uh, extremes uh, of light and darkness. And so the only perfect state of nature, say, rather reasonably concludes, uh, exists on the moon. Uh, and so modernity uh, has a lunar politics. Uh, the classic social contract theory uh, instantiates a lunar contract. Um, quoting from Le Parasite again, without atmosphere, uh, a film separates um, uh, black dark space uh, and the, the wh whiteness, uh, a, a furnace and a glacier a blinding flash uh, and opaque night. That's what state of nature and social contracts want to, to think reality in terms of, and he says that only happens on the moon. So the third stage, and we've had homogenization, we've had partition, the third stage is to see this blank, binarized, polarized opposition as a privileged place for exploitation and for the creation of dominating hierarchies, the different valuing of these two dichotomized poles. Yeah. Civil society, good. State of nature, bad. Uh, it leaves you with a sun and a satellite, uh, a measure and a deviation, uh, or a, in Hegelian terms, a master-slave, literally slave, relationship. Uh, it institutes a one-way, unequal, asymmetrical relationship between the state of nature and civil society. Now, in Rousseau's case, the homogenized and dichotomized poles of state of nature on one side and civil society on the other provide him with a normative measure. Uh, as was the case for the previous state of nature theorists, the relationship between the state of nature and civil society is, goes without saying, a very unequal one. Uh, those in civil society exploit the state of nature by appropriating its benefits, which for uh, John Locke were its land and people and natural resources, uh, and for Rousseau, uh, it's uh, naive amour de soi uh, and it's pity. Uh, they uh, exploit these for their own purposes. They try and incorporate them within civil society, uh, taking uh, what belongs to the state of nature and appropriating it. Um, it's a one-way asymmetrical relationship between these two dichotomized poles. There's no sense in which the state of nature exploits civil society. It's all one way. And so this threefold figure then, of reduction and partition and exploitation is, is my reading of the state of nature. But, um, and I hope this is where it gets a little bit more interesting, I think it's also a, a, a persuasive reading of modernity as a whole. I think this is what modernity does time after time after time, in domain after domain after domain. domain. It, it rehearses these three moves. Now, I just want to spend a, a couple of minutes trying to to back that up, because it's, it's a key part of what I'm going to try and argue later on when I get to Michel Sey. Um, so if we think, first of all, uh, about both rationalist and empiricist epistemologies, for example, what does Descartes do? Well, he starts with hyperbolic doubt. He creates a, a, a flat, undifferentiated space, not getting rid of everything necessarily that it is reasonable to doubt, but getting rid of everything that it is possible to doubt. Um, and then uh, within, within this flat space, uh, abstract uh, doubt is then set in opposition to the, the clear and distinct certainty 
that he claims to, to build from the, uh, the foundation of the cogito. Uh, that's the, the dichotomy. Uh, you've got the radical doubt and then the certainty. And then on that basis of this dichotomized opposition, reason is positively uh, valued and sense experience superstition and so forth are negatively valued. That's the moment of exploitation. But the same thing happens with empiricist epistemology. What does John Locke do? Well, he begins in his own language with the, the tabula rasa, what he calls the white paper or the empty cabinet, getting rid of all innate ideas starting from a blank slate. That's the moment of clearing and homogenization. Uh, and then he introduces the uh, dichotomized characters of, of primary qualities, uh, like bulk and figure and motion, uh, which he argues resemble the bodies to which they relate, uh, and the secondary qualities like colors and sounds and tastes, uh, which according to Locke bear no such relation to those bodies. And then he privileges the primary over the secondary qualities uh, for their truthfulness. And that's the moment of uh, differential valuing. Um, this is also the shape of thinking that's followed by um, modern ideas of space. If we think of Alexandre Coiré, uh, for example, uh, and his book from the uh, uh, closed world to the infinite universe. Uh, so modernity creates this idea of a homogenized, undifferentiated, infinitely extensible Cartesian space, uh, which knows neither the qualitative differentiation of Aristotelian places, uh, nor the religious distinction between the sacred and secular spaces, um, uh, but also has its own abject of unmappable non-Euclidean spaces as well that must be expelled uh, without outside. And then this subjection of space to the method of the Mathesis Universalis paves the way for the attitude that frames what Descartes classically calls being masters and possessors of nature. Uh, and that's again this moment uh, of exploitation that's brought about by the homogenizing and partitioning of space. Same happens with time. Uh, modernity classically thinks of one universal arrow of time. Just think of state of nature and civil society, for example. Uh, it's been called a monorail of time, a, a one single macro historical time that's cloven into a before or an after, uh, with the modern West very snugly and conveniently and self-congratulatory uh, uh, located in the after. Uh, and everyone else in the before. Uh, it's a, a cleaving apart of, of barbarism and enlightenment, uh, superstition, civilization, uh, on which the, the single line on which all groups without exception can be plotted at some point or another. Everyone finds themselves on this one uh, temporality uh, of uh, civilization. Uh, modernity also does the same thing with economics. Uh, Marx has famously explained how in modernity capitalism is the great flattener of all values, the great homogenizer, the universal solvent, as he puts it, uh, the universal self-established value of all things that, quote, has robbed the world, uh, both the world of men and of nature, of its specific value, uh, replacing it with the one single liquefied, undifferentiated value of, of what Marx calls general equivalence, of course, which is then used to create differential value through the accumulation of capital, and that's the moment of exploitation again. So capital makes seemingly unrelated uh, commodities and services commensurable in the same way that the state of nature uh, makes very different communities of people commensurable uh, and equivalent to each other. And again, this, this flattening of difference um, undertake, is undertaken by every successful modern liberal state. This is what the state does. It takes different communities, different peoples, uh, and it tries to create one homogenized national space with one universal uh, sovereignty in the center. It smooths over and it liquefies the complex distributions of sovereignty that we find, for example, in the medieval guilds or in the complex involutions between medieval monarchical and ecclesiastical power. Uh, and it replaces them with a monopoly of sovereignty uh, concentrated in the centralized modern state. And the identity of the modern state emerges only after this flattening of difference, this suppression of difference. Uh, and the cult of the nation state expressed in modern nationalisms creates precisely this differential value coded in this context as patriotism uh, that leads uh, to uh, conflict uh, between these centers of artificial sovereignty. 
The same move is seen once more in the creation and curation of the racial categories in modernity, uh, of black and white, flattening so many distinctions uh, between different groups of people uh, and designating categories with vast internal differences, uh, reducing them to these, this bipolar understanding of race that modernity has uh, created for itself. Like the term, the state of nature, the designation black, covers over a broad range of differences and designates not a phenomenon discovered by European explorers, but one manufactured by European brutality, uh, homogenizing inhabitants of diverse African and Caribbean and other nations under an undifferentiated banner of slave and ruthlessly exploiting their labor, their bodies and their land. Modern science is another example of this same move as Stephen Chapin and Simon Schaffer have shown in their book Leviathan and the Air Pump. Robert Boyle's quintessential moment of the birth of modern science in the invention of the air pump is, is a pivotal moment in the, in the clarification of the scientific method, and it follows this same schema again. So what does Boyle do? He creates a pure space, a space literally evacuated of air, a, a vacuum which can... Uh, uh, provide a privileged space for the production then of scientific truth. And, and the scientific laboratory is um, uh, uh, an echo of, of this pure space of the vacuum pump, uh, cleared away uh, of all superstition where scientific truth can be produced. Uh, Sapin and Schaffer call it a disciplined space where experimental, discursive and social practices were collectively controlled by competent members. Uh, it's a privileged site set apart from the rest of the world, like civil society as opposed to the state of nature, um, where unverifiable observations and prejudices of the outside world uh, are expelled uh, and where, quote, matters of fact can be uh, manufactured. Uh, the pump itself, Boyle's air pump itself indeed, uh, is a mise en abime of the creation of this pure scientific space, uh, which is a privileged site for the creation of knowledge. Finally, the same happens with modern uh, modes of agriculture. Uh, first of all, there's, there's a flattening and a clearing uh, of the land, a getting rid uh, of all weeds, all vegetation, often all hedges. Uh, and then uh, there's uh, a homogeneous monoculture, huge fields planted uh, with the same crop, uh, which is then uh, exploited and valued primarily in terms of its quantitative yield, as we were learning this morning, the nutritional value uh, of which goes down and down and down. It's the same three moves, homogenization, partition, and exploitation, that modernity is rehearsing in all of these different areas again and again and again. So modernity creates what we might call its characteristic site by first installing a blank abstract regularity uh, and then drawing it into a binary relationship with something that stands outside it, that's expelled from it, and then deriving a hierarchy. Uh, that allows for the exploitation or differential valuing of this constructed binary. Now, the state of nature is one instance of this, but, but what I hope to have shown in the last few minutes is, is that it's by far the only instance of this. But what it, it does show is that the state of nature, therefore, acts, if you like, as a mise en abime of modernity. So as we look at the state of nature motif, we're actually interrogating and critiquing modernity in all these different areas, because the, the, the moves that the state of nature rehearses are repeated in all these different areas. The, the, this is, I would argue, what modernity does. This is modernity's characteristic calling card in, in all of these different domains. So enough for modernity um, as it's, it's reconstructed out of state of nature theory. I want to turn to now to Michel Serre, um, hopefully um, to some relief from the audience. Um, I'm finally going to get to uh, to say. So for each of these characteristic moments of the modern state of nature, homogenizing, partitioning, uh, and uh, hierarchization, Serre systematically rethinks and, and subverts what modernity is doing. He gives an alternative account, a non-modern account, if you like, uh, of how to think uh, about the world. Instead of reduction, he has noise. Uh, instead of partition, he has parasitism. And instead of exploitation, he has symbiosis. And taken together, these three moments, I think, 
represents a radical rethinking of the social contract tradition from the ground up. And I want to argue they present a potent blueprint uh, for thinking about society and politics uh, in a way that, that I would argue is, is better fitted to meet the great challenges that we face today uh, than is the position uh, that I've just described. So first of all, they're not reduction, but noise. Uh, whereas the classical state of nature begins with a homogenizing, clutter-clearing reduction, uh, Ser, as we all know, begins with noise. Uh, noise for Ser is chaotic potential. It's the tohu wabohu uh, of Genesis chapter 1 in the Bible, the formless and empty world that is then shaped into the sky and the sun and the moon and the fish and the animals and everything else. Uh, riffing on this biblical language, uh, Ser intones, in the beginning, there is noise. Uh, it's also the white noise of the atoms falling in the void before the clinamen sends them hurtling into each other. It's a noise of confusion, but it's also a noise of potential. It, it, it is, if you like, a, a generalised incipience, an almost rhythm, a magma bubbling just below the threshold of form and figure. And the classical state of nature has a, a, an idea of potential too, but it's a very different sort of potential. It's empty. It's inert. It's exploitable. Uh, it's boils of vacuum. Uh, it's the vacuum populi or the terra nullius, so-called, uh, of the colonised land. But the potential of Sir's state of nature, by contrast, is full. It's overflowing. It's unwieldy. It's abundant. It's intractable. Uh, and for Sir, therefore, we begin not with a blank slate, uh, bleached and sterilised of all particularity, uh, but with a, a nascent unruliness. Uh, and this noise is not therefore the enemy of form and figure. It's not to be burned and bleached like the differences between people that are convenient for the classical state of nature. Now, quite to the contrary, in fact. Uh, Sayer's noise is, is the carrier of the signal. It is that without which there cannot be a signal. Uh, noise for Sayer is the cradle in which sense is born, or the fluid in which it gestates. Uh, information is carried by noise, and information is drawn out of noise, for say. It's nothing but noise, really, rhythmed and patterned in particular ways. But noise is also uh, a temperamental medium, for say. It's both the condition of possibility of any information whatsoever, but also the condition of impossibility of the perfect passage of any information whatsoever. Uh, in uh, The Parasite, page 194, he says, a wire doesn't have to be heated very much for noise to increase. Uh, this excitement stops the message from passing, but sometimes it allows the message to pass, a message that cannot cross an unexcited channel. White noise is the condition for passing, for meaning, for sound, even for noise. And the noise is the prohibitor of its interception. Noise, or again, the parasite, is at the three points of the triangle, sending, reception, transmission. I heat a little, I hear, I send, I pass. I heat a little more, everything collapses. At the smallest increase in one direction or another can transform the entire communication system from top to bottom. So noise, for Serre, is the excluded, included, middle, uh, both the source of the system and its incessant interruption, uh, both inside and outside the signal, uh, and a million miles away from modernity's blank, white, abstract space of reduction. And this, of course, is what modernity, for said, doesn't understand. Uh, Descartes, who would burn down the whole house of knowledge just to expel the rats from the roof, doesn't realise that, quote, um, chance, risk, anxiety, disorder even, uh, can consolidate a system, close quote. So noise is therefore for sir the, the possibility of invention, and the possibility of evolution, the possibility to create a new system. Uh, it's alive with fluctuation and branching and inclination. But modern reductive stability, by contrast, uh, for sir is, is nothing other than death. Uh, the classical state of nature tries to create a space of harmonic, white, blanc, evenness. Uh, but the noisy parasite always breaks up 
this harmony. It always eats our bread. It always scrambles our messages. But the classic state of nature lusts for control, for perspicuity, for transparency, for clarity and distinctness. But it pays for that fantasy with the coin of violence and moribundity. What is more, Sayre shows us that modernity's figure of reduction is a fool's errand. Noise can't be eradicated. You can't chase the hairs away from your garden. And the Lord who tries to do so uh, always creates a new disorder of his own. One parasite simply replaces another. So the modern state of nature tries to create this, this flat, regular Cartesian space, but, but Sayre rather deliciously, I think, um, contrasts this to what he calls Pascalian space. Uh, a space of ineradicable noise and multiple centres of power. Uh, signal this side of the Pyrenees and noise the other, as he says. Uh, noise, in other words, is undecidable. Uh, the signals of language uh, are just parasites to a person who doesn't understand that language. One person's communication is another person's confusion. Uh, as Sir says, uh, the, the signal itself is a, a noise for the third. Uh, the one who is excluded, close quote. And signal and noise can, can tip over into each other unexpectedly as well, with the merest change in perspective uh, in what physicists call ambiguity theorem, uh, or what is common to us all in the frustrating experience of trying to follow a conversation across a crowded room when there's lots of other conversations going on at the same time. Uh, it's the, the attempt uh, against chaos to distinguish figure from ground. Uh, the attempt to maintain the distinction between signal and noise, uh, with always the possibility of tuning into other signals, uh, where one's first signal becomes noise for the other signals. So rather than Descartes' clear and distinct ideas, then, this Pascalian space is pregnantly unclear. It's burgeoningly, uncertainly indistinct. You're never quite sure what's signal and what's noise. And this Pascalian space for Sarah is the space of all culture. Her figures are merging from grounds, depending on the perspective that we take, and then blending back into the background noise as other figures emerge. Uh, quoting from Le Parasite, uh, whether it's uh, anthropology or religion, uh, the profane and the sacred uh, are part of the same generalized space for Pascal. Uh, whether it's uh, religion or politics, uh, all the human sciences, uh, all the, the, the quasi-knowledge um, of all uh, practices recognize a logic of this type. It is, perhaps, the general condition of all communication. Close quote. So just as modernity then creates a blank, smooth space for its state of nature, its sciences and its humanities and its agriculture and so forth, so also for Sarah, both the exact sciences and the human sciences exist in this dynamic Pascalian space of noise. And another feature of this Pascalian space for uh, Sarah is that it's zero sum. In other words, life and communication always rely on the, on the creation of order, the emergence of, of signals out of noise. But you can only make order in one place, or you can only let one signal emerge by creating disorder or by allowing disorder to persist in another place. So Cartesian space imagines that it can create order indefinitely, infinitely, at no cost, uh, which opens the door uh, to its blindness and to the uh, uh, consequences in terms of the natural world that we're seeing all around us at the moment. But Pascalian space knows that order and communication can only be produced through the burrowing and the creation of waste elsewhere. There's no order without ordure. Uh, Cartesian space disingenuously shifts all this cost off balance sheet, uh, but Serre is determined uh, to account for the whole picture, and his Pascalian space helps him to do that. Uh, noise, you see, always destroys one order as it builds up another. It always lets one signal emerge at the expense uh, of another becoming noise. Uh, noise gives, and noise takes away. So that was uh, the first uh, distinction, not uh, flattening, uh, not homogenization, but noise. So now on to Serre's second subversion uh, of modernity's characteristic gesture, not partition, but parasitism. 
partition, if you remember, creates always two dichotomized poles. We've got the state of nature and civil society. We've got monotone uh, and white noise. We've got civilization and barbarity. But parasitism always interweaves, always joins. And this is what I propose to call an ontological parasitism, to distinguish it from what I'm going to talk about in a few moments, which I'm going to call an elective parasitism. So modernity's state of nature is a science for Sayre of division. Uh, but what Sayre gives us in his own words is a science of relations. Uh, this is Sayre's response to the question he asks at the beginning of the parasite, what does it mean to live together? Uh, what is a collective? Uh, well, Sayre's answer, at least one of Sayre's answers, I think, is, is that it's a generalised parasitism. Uh, modernity's state of nature deals with anthropological atoms, uh, patterned on the self-sufficient, rational, uh, 18th century, early modern bourgeois male uh, with no commitments and no family ties. And the classical social contract theorists, Rousseau included, uh, all present humanity in this state of nature as solitary. It's no accident uh, that in Thomas Hobbes's classic, uh, often cited um, uh, summary of the state of nature, the first adjective that he has in that list is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. It is fundamental to the classic state of nature. A Bersaire state of nature is not populated at all by solitary beings. It's populated by connected, interdependent parasites. Uh, beings, for say, don't precede relations. He has what he calls elementary relations. Now, parasitism is not, not a dichotomy. Parasitism, for say, is an in-between. And so whereas the classical state of nature contrasts darkness to light and barbarism to civility and so forth, uh, and it makes progress by moving away from one of these poles, supposedly, and towards the other, well, the, the parasite always exists in the in-between, uh, between two equally undesirable poles, really, uh, white noise and monotone, uh, chaos and perfect harmony. Uh, for Sarah, there are always two ways to die. Uh, complete order and complete chaos. And simply fleeing from one of those will uh, 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 precipitate us into the jaws of the other. There's no solution. So where is the classic state of nature is peopled by these atomized bourgeois benefits maximizing um, abstracted males. The anthropological type of Sayre's state of nature is, as he calls it, parasitus sapiens. Uh, and, and humanity is parasitic for Sarah in, in, I think, at least seven ways. And he only explicitly mentions some of these. I've tried to fill in some gaps um, that, 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 that other people have talked about in relation to us being parasitic. So on the cellular level, uh, our cells contain, I'm, I'm informed by people who know about these things, um, energy-producing mitochondria that were originally parasitic on the cells, drawing energy away from them, but at some point in evolutionary history became incorporated into cells uh, and exist now in a symbiotic relationship with the cells in, in a, a process that's been called endosymbiosis. Uh, so at a very cellular level, we are constitutionally parasitic. On a bodily level, uh, the 300 types of bacteria that are merrily enjoying themselves inside your mouth at the moment, uh, or your gut bacteria feeding on the sugars and starches from this morning's breakfast, uh, are a line of defense against infections. And, and without this microbiota, this bacteria, these archaea, these fungi, these protozoans and these viruses, we would die. We could not be the people that we are without these uh, happy parasites inside us. At an interpersonal level, uh, each one of us was parasitic on our mother for the nine months of our pre-birth life, not to mention the vicarious parasitism of the father on the mother. And I speak as a father here. Uh, she bears the whole weight of the pregnancy. She bears the whole cost. Uh, the father is parasitic, I think, uh, on that relationship. And indeed, sometimes our birth can cost our mother her life, as was the case with Rousseau. Now, birth does little to change this parasitism. Uh, the human infant among animals is quite unusually dependent for quite an unusual length of time uh, upon its parental milieu. On a social level, uh, the domestication of grains and animals, which is so tightly tied to hominization in the Neolithic period uh, and beyond, is, is itself a parasitic practice. We are parasitic 
on the domesticated crops and the domesticated animals, without which we wouldn't be the humans that we are. And this is an argument made by Yeovil Noah Harari and, and others. At the cultural and linguistic level, we're all parasites of our tongues and languages on the basis, as Sarah explains, that the host can be understood as a, as a milieu, a, a necessary cultural niche outside which the human animal couldn't exist. So take away all our language, take away all our culture, what you have left is not human in any way that we would recognize. We are parasitic on this milieu of language and culture. So as well as being parasitic on our biological mothers, Sarah argues, we are parasitic on our mother tongues. And of course, on the ecological level, we're all parasitic on the planet Earth, uh, on its air, on its water, on its food. Uh, the Earth is not our environment as if we were somehow at the center. Uh, the Earth is our host. So in all these ways, parasitism for Sarah systematically precedes like-for-like like exchange or market relationships. Um, he, he's fond of, of riffing on the idea uh, of man is a wolf to man. So he has the idea of man is a flea to man. Uh, man is a host to man. Uh, or again, in my favorite, flea is a man to wolf. It takes a little bit of thinking about it. It's brilliant. Flea is a man to wolf. So if the human uh, is parasitic through and through for Sarah, then so is society as well. Uh, and we can see this in terms of uh, the three of the central features of civil society in classic social contract theory, namely sovereignty, uh, the social bond, and property. Uh, so first of all, sovereignty. Uh, in terms of sovereignty, Sarah identifies the sovereign as the universal parasite. Um, in his uh, reading of Lafontaine's fable, the heifer, kid, and sheep in partnership with the lion, uh, the lion is a splendid example of Hobbes's Leviathan, uh, paying for its lunch with empty phrases backed up by overwhelming force. Uh, the secret of politics, says Sir, is that the strongest is the parasite. Now the social bond. Whereas the classic social contract theory, uh, the social bond rests on the assumption that everyone is better off in civil society than they would be outside it, uh, an idea known as the Hobbesian hypothesis. For Sir, civilization is built on what he calls the very first monuments of, my, of our culture, which he names as parasitic hospitality, conviviality, table manners, uh, and relations of generosity with the stranger. Uh, of course, etymologically, parasitos means to eat next to, eating next to. And the social bond is also created for Sir by quasi objects, uh, the cultural equivalent of these domesticated crops and animals that make us who we are. Now, the passing of quasi-objects between us, like money or bread or wine or words or drugs or rugby balls, creates the collective. For the classic social contract theorists, everyone brings their little brick of me, and together we build a wall of us. Uh, <laughs> Sir, Sir does not pull his punches. He dismisses this as imbecilic. Uh, and worthy of a politician's speech, he says. Uh, for Sir, by contrast, the we emerges from the exchanges of the eye, uh, substituting one eye for the next as the quasi object is passed round. The us is not the sum of all eyes, but it's something new produced by the concessions and resignations of the eye, for Sir. So for Sir Lafontaine's fable, the town rat and the country rat perfectly defines this society. Everybody eats everybody else's food. There's no contract of reciprocity. Thirdly, property. Uh, property is, of course, a, a central feature of classic social contract theories. Uh, for Hobbes and Locke, it's a jewel in their crown. Uh, and for Rousseau, it's a thorn you know, in their side. Uh, but for Sir, uh, quoting the natural contract, rights of mastery and property come down to parasitism. A property is not so much about what is mine, for Sir, but about what is not yours. Uh, not so much about what is propre, my own, but what is malpropre, uh, unclean, so that no one else wants to go anywhere near it. So how do I make the soup mine? Little tip for dinner today. <laughs> I spit in it. Um, or if you're Sartre, you vomit on the roof, on the uh, root, he says. How do I make the colonies, supposedly living in a state of nature, mine? 
Well, I abuse them. I brand them. I displace them like ornaments in my own home that I can move wherever I will. How do I make the world mine? I pollute it. Or rather, I clear it of other people's pollution before I can add my own and make it mine. So there's no need to dig a trench or to set up a fence around the soup or the salad if we've already spit in it, Sir points out. And this is what he calls an excremental theory of property. The first person who defecated in a place and found others disgusted enough to let him or her have it was the founder, he says, of civil society. It's a form of appropriation through parasitism. And this is, in fact, I think, not so far away from the Lockean notion of property as appropriation and productivity that creates waste. Now, idealist philosophy, Sarah argues, is the intellectual equivalent of this excremental account of property, uh, making the whole world my representation, uh, spitting uh, in the existential soup, uh, making it all my territory, my excrement. But parasitism always undermines and, uh, these dichotomized accounts of property as well for sir. We can't simply enclose a piece of ground and say, this is mine, and find people simple enough to believe us because the rabbit will always get back in. Uh, we see this in, in dispossessions, in fires, in floods, in wars, in thefts, uh, and perhaps today supremely, uh, in terms of the classic paradigm of property, uh, we see it in the undermining of intellectual property uh, on the internet. So the final way now in which Sir uh, subverts these three key moments of classic social contract theory and, and classic uh, modernity, not exploitation, but symbiosis. Not exploitation, but symbiosis. So in a third subversion of modernity in its account of the state of nature, Sarah replaces modern exploitation through parasitic symbiosis. And this is now the elective parasitism that I said I'd, I'd come back to. I, I, I was talking previously about what I'm calling ontological parasitism. Uh, a, a state of being that, that we're not at liberty to change. What I'm talking about now is the way that we choose to relate to the world and to other people, which, which I'm labeling elective parasitism. Now, parasitism, of course, is always an unequal exchange. Uh, proteins for energy, in, in, in the case of mitochondria, uh, pro progeny for food, words for a meal, the soft for the hard, sight for locomotion, in Lafontaine's parable. And this inequality need not be exploitative for Sarah, but it often is. Uh, it's often the strong exploiting the weak. It's the man, uh, uh, as was uh, quoted this morning wonderfully already, who takes milk from the cow and gives it death in exchange. Uh, or the colonizer who takes the land of people in the state of nature and gives them slavery in exchange. Uh, it is a leonine contract. It's what Sayre calls a bad or unjust contract, an exploiter's charter, uh, like the legal arrangements that governed early, the early modern conquest of the New World and its so-called state of nature, uh, and like the modern relation of subject and object. If this is civil society, Sayre says, uh, he doesn't want a bit of it. What he wants is symbiotic society. And for modernity, it's this third moment that introduces exploitative parasitism. But for Sarah, it's this third moment in which exploitative parasitism is actually overcome in the direction of sustainable symbiosis. So what Sarah proposes is he calls a new contract. Uh, he, he admits that it looks horribly unjust according to what he calls the crypto-egalitarian ideology of exchange. Uh, it brings a new epistemology, a new theory of balance. And this new theory of balance is, in a word, he says, symbiosis, uh, which in Sayre's lexicon is a synonym for what we might call good parasitism. Uh, modernity uh, tries to, to think that it begins always with exchange relationships within the market, calculated profit and loss relationships. Uh, but for Sayre, things are, I think, a lot subtler than that. Uh, we start with giving freely and receiving freely, ontological parasitism in all the different ways that I stepped through a few moments ago. Uh, and then we move through exploitative exchange, parasitism, 
uh, in order to arrive at, at what he holds out uh, as a, a, a happy uh, ending place, which is uh, uh, the unequal exchange of symbiosis. Symbiosis is what the combatants in um, Goya's fight with cudgels at the beginning of the natural contract never graduate to, never understand. Um, they're splendid and spirited exploiters, and that is what they always remain, interminably exchanging as they sink into the sand that's holding them up. Another way of thinking about this would be to say that symbiosis is the social contract with the excluded third included. And the natural contract, as Sir proposes it, is just an extension, therefore, in the juridical sphere of symbiosis in the biological sphere. Uh, it's a means to scaffold the transition from exploitative parasitism to sustainable symbiosis. It's not natural, and I, I think this is sometimes a, a misunderstanding that, that we come across. It's not natural because it's simply there and doesn't need any work. Now, the natural contract per se needs actively imposing on a situation of abuse in order to mitigate and hopefully eventually end that abuse. It requires a work of pedagogy, not simply a declaration. And the symbiotic contract for Sir is a way of what he calls mastering our mastery. Uh, and it's also a safeguard into, uh, against falling back into exploitative parasitism. Uh, but is, as Sir warns us, abuse always precedes and haunts any contract. And a contract will always remain something of an oddity, an island of symbiosis. Uh, in an ocean of abuse. N nor does the natural contract render null and void the social contract, which I think is another misunderstanding that people sometimes have. Uh, in in um, Le Parasite, he uh, emphasizes the, the equal importance of three different contracts uh, that run in parallel, the natural contract, the social contract, and what he calls the gnosiological contract between subjects and objects. All three of them, he says, need to be transitioned into symbiosis. And so Sensian symbiosis, I think, shouldn't be seen as some grand, brave or virtuous ideal. It's motivated in substantial part by the baldest self-interest. The alternative to symbiosis is death uh, and the extermination of the host. So it hardly needs unrealistically virtuous people. It just needs a little enlightened self-interest. Um, setting the bar at try not to die it's not very high. Uh, nor is symbiosis anodyne or safe for Sev. Uh, Sev advocates, for example, negotiating a contract of symbiosis with cancer rather than trying to exterminate it. Uh, and one feels he would probably say the same thing about COVID as well. It's not a comfortable sort of um, cardigan and slippers approach uh, to society. As a final word now, I want to try and take a bit of distance from Sayre uh, and suggest one area where I think he, he may have missed something uh, in uh, his account of symbiosis. Because I do think that it leaves something important unsaid. Uh, if you like, his account needs its own parasite to supervene upon it and make it more of itself than it ever was before. And it's this. Say couches his symbiosis in the language of reciprocity. He calls it a contrat de réciprocité. But I think this still maintains the bipolarity of subject and object, of giver and receiver, that, that, that elsewhere in his thoughts he's doing a great deal to muddy and problematize. And what his symbiosis points us towards, I think, is, is something richer uh, and more complex than this reciprocity. And, and I'm going to give it the name mutuality. Um, it's what Goya's fighters with cudgels need. They don't need more reciprocity. Uh, they need a sense of mutuality to frame and contextualize the reciprocity which they're all too keenly aware of. It's what the quasi-object is pointing us to as well, I think, this idea of mutuality. Uh, it's the idea that I am part of, a partaker in the world. Um, that there's a, a huge sort of philosophical to and fro in state of nature theory as to whether human beings are part of nature or not. Um, and it's, it's as yet unresolved. Uh, 
but I think this this paradigm of mutuality that I'm commending uh, would would situate human beings very squarely uh, as part of the natural world. This this is hummus. This is Adama, uh, the earth, soil. What else is it? What else am I? Uh, but part of this world, made out of the same stuff as this world. I am earth in that sense. So the economy of due exchange and uh, the economy of favour is the distinction that Sayer tries to draw. So I, I think he realises that reciprocity doesn't get him all the way he wants to get. But, but he, he doesn't reach for mutuality. He reaches for this economy of gré, of favour or gift. Um, and he opposes this economy of gré uh, to, the, to the economy of exchange and market relationships. He says it's two ways of living. It's two logics. But I wonder and I fear if they're quite as distinct as he would have us believe. Uh, gift and exchange can both be part of mutuality, or better, they're both underpinned by mutuality, but I don't think either of them can exist without it. And so it, it's curious, perhaps, that this language of mutuality is missing from Sayre's lexicon. Uh, mutuality is not just the epiphenomenon of multiple transactions of reciprocity, it is quite literally, and think of Goya again, the ground on which reciprocity takes root. It's reasonably clear, I think, that Sayre's lifting his idea of the economy of favour from a theological register. And, and within that register, I think it functions quite nicely, quite well. Uh, as the Apostle Paul says in Acts 17, God is the one who gives us unilaterally life and breath and everything else, and there's nothing that we can offer him because everything belongs to him already. So theologically, I think the logic of, of Gré uh, works fine. But as Sayre himself admits, this logic is for the gods. Uh, not for the humans. Uh, but when it comes to social or ecological relationships, I think the economy of favour really struggles to occupy this foundational position. And, and I want to propose that it's mutuality that most fundamentally frames our relationship to the earth. I'm part of it, not over against it. Uh, and my relationship with you as well, uh, and yours with me, it's mutuality that makes sense of the favour of the gifts that can pass between us. So, final sentence. Say laments uh, that in fact today, uh, Société du Gré have disappeared, he says, and the only alternative is this Société du Droit et Avoir, so societies of, of right, of calculation, of having. Well, I wonder whether we need to mourn them quite as much as he does. Uh, what we need, perhaps, is a third thing, uh, which is Société du Partage, societies of mutuality or of sharing. Thank you.